It's a real labour of love that film, isn't it? I think we were just saying out, outside, it's nice that the, the guy that made it, Javi, was you know from Madrid and was an outsider from not not from Manchester because it's a kind of a different view of the place. What did you make of the film when you when you first saw it? I mean, he I was aware of it very early. He he came to me about it and he asked me what I thought and. And the one thing that I said, and he did pick up on it, I said, well, if you're going to tell that story, you need to connect it earlier. And, and like two of the people that were in the film were Colin Curtis and Mike Shaft. And these were guys that date back to the 70s and really laid a lot of the foundations for what happened with the later DJs there. But often the story doesn't start till the Hacienda, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and also it doesn't start till the Hacienda in 1988. Um, and so often what led up to that situation is missed, which um, in Manchester's case was a very strong black music scene and um, an open-mindedness in the city that enabled um, the black crowd to come into the center and bring their influence into play. And that was in contrast to Liverpool, which is the city that closest city to where I'm from, um, where you know there was like a, a racism within the city that stopped that dynamic from from happening. The other city that it, it happened in 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 the UK around the same time, we weren't so aware of, of what was going on there. It was a bit of an island. Was was Bristol, which turned up later with massive attack and tricky and, and everything. So Manchester, for me, it was all about that open-mindedness, the mixture, it was students moving into the areas, the black areas like Moss Side and Hume, and this interaction of ideas that went on that eventually resulted in what we know as the kind of acid house rave scene from, from a Manchester perspective, obviously you had the the London lineage as well with, with Shum and things like that. Um, so that that was important that he, he told that and I think I think he delivered it really well. What, what I like about the film is it's got, it's got a lot of heart. It's not um, it's not a history as such. It's not like um, this happened, then that happened. It's it's about linking to the past, but it's very much showing you where we are in the present and that this is an ongoing uh, situation. Yeah. And part of a lineage that goes way back. I mean, you could go with Manchester. Really, the foundation of everything that happened there goes back to the early '60s to a club called the the Twisted Wheel. And there was a DJ there, a guy called Roger Eagle, who'd come up from Oxford, and he was like a rhythm and blues and blues music, just obsessive. And him and people like Guy Stevens in London at a club called The Scene, which is where the mods used to go, um, they opened the import channels so that they'd be like uh, mail ordering records from Chicago and New York, and, and then shops would emerge that would do the same thing and bigger level. So they're the start of, of, of all this and how it emerges. So Manchester with the twisted wheel, and Roger Eagle was there for a period of time, and when he went, other DJs came into play, and this became the club where Northern Soul evolved from. And Northern Soul is a confusing thing to a lot of people. What is it? In a nutshell, it was like the music of Motown in, in, in the 60s in, in Britain was so loved. People loved that music so much that when the music moved on and into a more kind of funk-based sound that emerged in the 70s a lot of people wanted still that 60s sound so they started digging deeper for older records and looking for derivatives of Motown and realizing that as Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and the Supremes and you know all these amazing acts the Four Tops Temptations were having big big hits there was 101 small labels that were trying to do the same sound and, and that's what Northern Soul is it's uh it's going back into the 60s and 
digging deeper for rarer records on more obscure labels. Yeah. And so that's from Manchester, that emerged from Manchester <clears throat> as well. Talking about the twisted wheel, I mean, it's quite interesting in the film when we, when we see, you know, your night there legend on a Wednesday night, yeah. because obviously in a film that, that of that length, it just seems like that night just took off instantly. What Was it like that? No. Like, yeah. legend, have to build it? legend was this incredible club that had been opened in Manchester in 1981. It had the best sound system I'd heard in the country at the time. It was incredible. And it had the first club I worked in with SL1200 <coughs> Technics and it was a dream. Um, but what had happened is they'd originally, they'd had a black mu specialist black music night on a Wednesday and, and that's the arena that I was in at the time. And they had a guy called John Grant doing it who was a big name. And, um, but he got poached by another venue and like a big magazine and a radio station got involved and they just took the crowd and took the crowd from legend and they had their night. And I was doing a successful night in Wigan which was owned by the same, Wigan Pier was owned by the same people as own legend. So they gave me a, a go on the Wednesday, really. And I think the first night I was there, they were down to, it was a club that held about 500 and they were getting like regular 350, 400 on a Wednesday, but it was down now to 90 people. It was, it was failing. And the first instance is to try and stabilize that. You've got to, and keep the people that you've got, otherwise the night's gonna go in a couple of weeks. And so we managed to do that. And I remember like, for a period of weeks, months, that, you know, I'd say at the end of the night, how many were in, and he'd say like, 97, he's like, oh, nice one, you know. <laughs> and then the next week it'd be like 94, and it'd be just a disaster, you know. Like, oh, the loop. And, and, and bit by bit we built it, but what was really interesting was that there came a crucial point where this other night, which was, the big midweek night in Manchester at the time was called the main event. That as Legend was picking up, picking up, it was obviously the more superior, it was a superior club. So it's picking up. And, and interestingly, the main event was held at the old Twisted Wheel. So there's a link there. And, and they actually tried to switch the night to our club, which would have meant me falling back behind two other DJs who, after building it to that point, I would have been back like, you know, like yeah, right. the warm up. <laughs> and fortunately, the manager said, No, we think we can do it. And, and, and that's what happened. And, um, and it's like they were there and we were here, and it pulled up, pulled up. And when it got to about here, it closed the other club in weeks. And all of a sudden, there were queues up the road, and, and that remained away every Wednesday night for 18 months. It just, and people were coming in from Birmingham and Bradford, Sheffield, Leeds, Huddersfield. It, it was the magnet and the music that, that was being played again at that moment, all this kind of new electronic music coming out of New York, electro, it was black and Latino kids getting their hands on the technology for the first time and mm. twisting it and making this. And out of this music would come, you know, the directions of techno and, and house and hip hop would emerge through things like the message Grandmaster Flash, which was full on electronic. And, and so I had the right environment, um, the right music, predominantly black crowd, serious crowd. To talk about the crowd, I was saying this before when we had the, um, I had the talk with Giles, that in, you know, these were kids that in their day-to-day -day life were just getting abused on a daily basis racially no job prospects for them. The police were arresting them for the slightest thing. It was a shit life in lots of ways and it was a pressure cooker life and that needed a relief. And that relief came within the clubs. So, so some of that dancing was a serious business. It wasn't a party or fun. This, was, this gave you status in your community and you, had, you could walk with your head high and people would say you were special and you were yeah, yeah. you might not have any money in your pocket and so these scenes and, and people would travel distance people would come from Birmingham which was a hundred miles away you know I remember I used to do mixes for the radio and, and um, th th there used to be a crew come from Birmingham and park at a service station to tune into the mixes so they could hear that wow. years later I met I met like a group of lads uh, fr from from there and they were talking about coming up to Wigan Pier and they were saying the first thing they did when they got to Wigan was siphon petrol off another car 
they had enough money to get there and enough money to get in, but they didn't have enough money to get back. But by hook or by crook, they were going to be there. And that was the dedication yeah, of the right. people on that scene because these were the places where you could get this music. Yeah. It wasn't everywhere, you know, it was certain DJs that were, were, were that way. So, you know, I was in a very fortuitous position with the environment. And the thing that I introduced into it, that again, was I, I started to mix. And this was at a time where not many DJs in the UK were mixing. And the emphasis went on that. So with this new music, this new electronic music coming through that was more mixable, and the environment that I had and, and the audience, it just, it was a phenomenal thing, you know. Um, and so Legend was my, that was my club. I mean, I later worked at the Hacienda towards the end of 1983. And uh, at the time, the Hacienda was struggling badly for identity. It was a big cold, generally empty type of space. <laughs> they just hadn't got it right. They'd, um, the DJ booth was in a room next to the stage, down where you had a slat to look for. It, it, they, they, they hadn't, it, later they put it on the balcony in the iconic position, but in the initial stages, and they survived because Blue Monday had a massive hit, um, New Order had a massive hit with Blue Monday. Otherwise, that club wouldn't have survived because there was no business logic. I mean, there's a book by Peter Hook that talks about it all. It, tell, it tells you <laughs> that's the end of how not to run a club, which is <laughs> how it was. But that's why it was so successful in the end because the people behind it weren't normal business people. They were just these mad dreamers. Yeah. And they held on and eventually the environment changed. Ecstasy came into play. There was this house music. It all and there you are it's the right place the right time and now everybody talks about it yeah, but not during my time though <laughs> it wasn't too great let's talk a little bit about you because I'm a huge fan of your work um, can I take you back to sort of 1984 when you did the, the Squiddy Polity okay yeah absolute would be I mean genius idea putting the two tracks together this is decades before mashups right what, how did that idea occur to you and what well, by 84, I'd stopped DJing. I was trying to get into production. I wanted to remix because now we knew all these guys out in New York were remixers. And Larry Levan, T. Scott, Francois Gavorkin, these were DJs, but they remixed. And I thought, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. And I had lots of contacts with the record companies in the UK. Um, and I'd say to them, I'd like to remix something. They're kind of saying, well, it's Americans who remix. You know, as though it was a prerequisite that you had to be. <laughs> and I, honestly, I was buying a against Spirit Wall just trying to get some work, and that wasn't happening. So, and also, I had nothing to demonstrate what I could do because I'd never done a remix. So, I, I, one of the things I thought of was because I was, by this point, I was doing mixes like DJ mixes for radio, and I was editing tape as well. So, I was kind of being a bit more involved with, with, with stuff. And so I, I put together a kind of series of mixes, actually for, a, for, for radio again, but the real purpose of them was to send to the record companies. And I, I picked um, a well-known track, like Chaka Khan, I feel, mm -hmm. for you, yeah. or, or the Scree Politi stuff, or Frankie Goes to Hollywood, something they'd know, so they could hear what I did. It was like, a, a day. it didn't really kind of get me much work at, at the end of the day. What was the reaction, though, when you played it to them? Like, did they get it? It's, not really. Some people. I mean, uh, again, I, I mentioned this I think earlier today that when I came back into DJing in two thousand and three, after like this twenty year gap, the whole re-edits culture had started to emerge, and I slipped straight into that from this previous point. And um, the first night I played, I played that a Chaka Khan edit of "I Feel for You." And I remember at the time I originally did it, no one was interested. Yet here I am, twenty years on, and people are saying, "What's this edit?" You know, and I'm like, "This is bizarre." You know, <laughs> times change, a different context, a different period, and um, well, that's the reason I did them at the time was literally to try to hustle some work yeah. as a remixer. I think I, I think I read somewhere that when you did those mixes, you you, you know, you're in your own flat or whatever. Yeah, so it was pretty rudimentary um, equipment, and you were just using two twelves of the same track. Yeah, and then and then uh, bouncing that down because I did. I, I, we didn't call. There was no term re-edits. I, I call these turntable edits because I'd use 
sometimes two turntables. So in that scritty, there's a part where there's a repeat thing and it's just two turntables just going between the two. Um, I had a cassette deck that I could have little samples running from and I had my reel-to-reel, -reel, which I could edit on. Uh, a brilliant mixer <coughs> called the Matam, which was designed by a, a guy called Froggy, who was one of the um, de like mixing originators in the UK, a guy from London, and he designed this fantastic... Uh, I've got it when I did the tube on the TV. It's called the Matam from Huddersfield it was, it was made. So I... For then, it was incredible equipment that I had. Yeah, I mean, because right. people didn't have SL1200s at home. I mean, clubs didn't have them. We had them at Legend, but uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't like all around like they are now. Most Because back before that, there were these old belt-driven turntables like Garrard and, you know, that, that, and Citronic, I think, that people, people used. And when mixing first emerged, which was in 78 when we first started to learn about it and understand what was going on a bit more in New York. People tried to mix, but there was no very speed on them for a start. And <laughs> if you tried to manipulate them, the record jumped and it was like, so everyone just... Game on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so it was a slow process for mixing to come in. And it ha really, we, the, we had to catch up with the equipment. We didn't... I mean, I went to Germany in... 1980 and did a two-month contract in a club there and um, they were way ahead of us in terms of the, the gear they were using. That's the first time I used 1200s was in Germany Yeah, right. Uh, and I saw a, a, a DJ in a club in Essen mixing kind of black music and alternative music together and it was completely mixed and, and, and it really made a big impression even though I'd seen someone in England do it in 78 the original guy who brought it over from the States, a guy called Greg James it was this guy in Germany that really made me think this is something that I could bring into play in the right circumstance and legend was the right circumstance. So Yeah, right. That's what so have you got like a treasure trove of these that like have you got a closet full of these that you a closet full of what? <laughs> <laughs> of edits that you're gonna are you a bit like Don Morales where No, <laughs> no, no I mean, you know, most of the stuff that I, I, I did out there, there's a few bits and bobs and but probably not worth, you know, most of my stuff's shared as soon as I kind of get it done, really. And does the whole digital thing sort of excite you, like the, the, the potential of doing, you know, edits digitally? Or are well, you, of do, course, do you, just, yeah. you know, I mean, I was a bit of a Luddite through the 90s. I wasn't DJing. It had dried up a little bit with regards to my recording projects and production, so I was a little bit kind of lost there. And there was a period of time where it was like, you know, I'm this old man and all these young kids and they know technology until a friend of mine said, yeah, but they haven't got your experience, and that kind of made me think, okay, with regards to editing, for example, I know all about editing. I've edited for thousands of hours on tape, yeah. so I know that, um, but I don't know what buttons to press. They know what buttons to press, but they've got to learn how to, and they've got to put the hours in. So that kind of reframed it for me, and I was able to... Um, I was actually on the dole at the time. I was really struggling financially. There was no openings, couldn't get money together for studio. We had to pay for studios then. It wasn't like now you're doing your computer. You had to get 500 quid together to get in the studio. So, you know, they were kind of pressuring me to do a normal job, which I've never done a normal job in my life. And, and, and it was getting on top. They were going to send me to some supermarket or something to stack shelves or I don't know. But one of the things they were doing was saying people you could train. And I had a friend, he, he'd like started a radio production company, bought this um, computer system called Sadie, which was, it was like radio standard. It, it cost 15 grand at the time, it was really expensive. It's a bit like Pro Tools, but early days and bigger. And so I said, you know, train me up on that. I'll get them to pay you. And, and that's what happened. And that enabled me then to kind of start to look at the digital thing. Like eight later, people would say, do you still edit on tape? And it's like, well, of course not, because digitally, for example, if I wanted to take a, 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 a bar loop but make that a 16-bar intro, I had to record that 16 times and splice it and edit it each time, whereas digitally, I have to record it once and then press 15. And then <laughs> then it so there was no way that I was going to kind of... Did you enjoy that process though when you were doing it? Like when I edited originally, yeah. oh, I loved it. Yeah. It so was, are you are you a kind of journey person or the or the the end 
Like, is the is the satis does, is the satisfaction making it, or is it at the end when you get to? Hear I never it? really thought of both in a sense. I, I mean, I, what I loved about editing was it was very meditative. I just felt, I, and I've done sessions editing that have gone on for a day and a half. You know, literally, you know, into well into the next day that I'm sat at a machine. So I was in a kind of zone with it. It, it. it seems mad now in comparison with what you can do with digital, but at the same time as that, you know, um, because that was the way it was then, you didn't think of anything else. That yeah. was the way that you approached it. You had to put the time in and you had to have the patience. It's like the same with like, with people, in, it, it doesn't, for me, um, follow that a DJ becomes a producer. Some DJs can become producers, but some DJs, it's the live environment, it's the now that they're in. So you stick them in a clinical studio, listening over and over and over to something, and you know that doesn't suit certain people's aptitude. So, but I, I, I love that for some reason, you know, and, and the mathematics of it always. Um, I noticed like many years before, I remember that, that I did a, a kind of a hospital radio show when I was 16 and, that, and the guy who was presenting before me, there used to be a technique, a radio technique called, but probably still is, called voice into vocals that you talk over the intro and then the vocal comes in and that's like a perfect mix to, to do a voice, you know. And I watched him in the studio with a stopwatch and I watched him cue up the, the track because he was doing over monitors and he's stopwatch timing it. And then I see him go on the mic and he starts to stopwatch and he's talking. And I'm realizing he's doing it to the stopwatch. He can't hear the rhythm. Yeah, he's yeah. not hearing. Uh, for me, it was automatic. And I, I actually had to think about it. I thought, what, why? Because, you know, I'm like, why have I got this natural rhythm? Where's this got, come from? And, and I worked it out in the end that it wasn't a natural rhythm, it was something that was acquired because I grew up in like a place where there were two functions rooms below and mobile discos came in and out and there was always music playing <coughs> and often I'd be in bed at night and fall asleep even in this way but there was a mm, 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 <laughs> coming through the constantly and I think that seeped into my body yeah, right. and that gave me a sense of rhythm so that you know because I, I noticed since that you know like <clears throat> I can I, I might say to some even an engineer who's a you know studio person yeah it's, it's the third beat of the fifth bar and see them struggle to find that, that the, you know, whereas it's automatic, it feels that way. So I don't know where those things, you know, as I say, I, I, I've tried to think about it and that's where I put it to, but certain people have an aptitude for things mm. and, and, and other people don't, you know, and that kind of, the editing side of it was always, you know, th there was something else that was beyond just making the tracks. There was a process in there that quieted me and, I enjoyed working in that space. Yeah, right. We've probably got time for a couple of questions. If you've got a question for Greg, just pop up your hand. I'll just ask you though, Greg, before we finish, um, so what's next for you? What, what, you, what, you, what would you like to, have you got any projects? I mean, you've got the new label. Well, I um, mean, everything's kind of ongoing and set up and doing its thing. I mean, I've, I've got like, my son's 20 now and he's, he's a musician. He's been in bands since he was like 12, but he's also started DJing. Um, there's also a guy who works with me called Josh Ray, another DJ, these are both another, but I'm, not, I'm kind of bringing, want to bring their energy more into play now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, at a certain age, that, that I, I like the idea of overseeing things, but I don't want everything put in on me, which generally is the case, you know, it's like, um, I generally find that, you know, say for example, when I did the, we did the Super Weird Substance album, which was great, <laughs> But they wanted to call it Greg Wilson presents Super Weird Substance. Whereas mm -hmm. it, I, I went with them in the end on that. But I'm trying to do something that doesn't have to hang on me being about. You know? Yeah, right. So, you know, I want to kind of develop in that way. I'm busy enough with like the DJ bookings and everything, and and I want to, you know, kind of I do do my blog. Yeah, and, your and blog's amazing. Put more attention to that. So there's there's only enough hours. So I just want to kind of really delegate I think that's probably the best term delegate a, a bit now so life's good right yeah life's good you know I mean I mean the, 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 the fact that I can travel around and here I am I'm talking to people in this room it's it's um, it, it's 
it's you know I, I just said before there was a time in the 90s where you know it was it was like the kind of Marlon Brando on the waterfront I could have been a contender I could have been someone what happened I was like it was going well and now so you know I, I don't take this for granted because I've, I've understood it from the other side and I, and I really did think at that time that pretty much I'd missed the boat in, in lots of ways you know life had moved on and you know I hadn't moved with it so you know the fact that I get to travel, I get to meet people, people are engaged, interested in these things, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Fantastic. Does anyone have a question for Greg? This one just there. Yeah, you, how do you incorporate the real world into your current yeah. Yeah, There's two aspects to it. I mean, what I did, and this was after, I de after, after I'd stopped DJing when I was producing, I used to um, record sounds, effects, bits of record samples, and, you know, whooshes, crashes, and separate them with called leader tape, you know, and um, and then I used to, when I was producing, I used to sit in the studio and, and just let the tape play and hear random sounds and oh that that sounds nice and maybe it's, I'll use that one time or maybe I'll take it into a sampler and play it in and make more of a feature of of something. So the the reel to re I started building these reel to reel these reels up with sounds on. And when I came back to DJing, I was like, uh, I decided to go in from the laptop route, and I was working on a system called PC DJ at the time. But I liked the idea of the juxtaposition of this antiquated piece of equipment mm -hmm. against this, you know, state of the art as it was then. And um, that balance is always important to me, you know, like balancing the past with the present. You know, it's I don't want to be Mr. Nostalgia. There's no kind of lifespan in that. You know, it's like it's got to kind of keep moving forward and that enables me to, to, to do that. So, so the Revox, like, even though it's, an, you know, people said at once, that, well, you could do that off a kind of, you know, kind of some kind of unit or something. You probably could, but it's like my instrument. I kind of play it. It's, I've got a feel for it. And I know, you know, so, and I like, I like the idea that it's still important and people love it, you know, yeah. I mean, it's become my, my kind of, logo in a sense yeah. you know it's it's what people associate and you know people always say have you got it with you as though I'm going to say well no I haven't brought it here because <laughs> they'd be very disappointed if it wasn't a, they, they probably want to see it more than they want to see me in a, yeah. a lot of cases a friend of mine played with you down uh, in Melbourne and just had a shot of you on the top of the Reeboks so yeah they didn't want me <laughs> <that. laughs> but I do it myself in that view from the day just take the Reeboks we've got time for one more question does anyone have a question for Greg? No? Is there a book in you? Oh, again, we were talking about this. It's like I'm repeating myself. <laughs> um, I, I wrote um, the first draft of a book back in, before I started DJing again in 2003. Um, I, and it was all about the early 80s period and putting that in perspective. But I'm not a book writer. And so I realised that to go for the second draft and the third draft is a massive time consuming process that involves combing through, adding new information. I'd love to do it, but it's to find that time, you know, I mean, it, I would really need a few months to kind of properly do that. And so um, one day, one day, but you know, it's written, to, I've, I've drawn from that a lot in the blog. So a lot of the pieces I've written, I've been able to go to that, what I did and, and, and take it from it. So, you know, it has been really useful so far, but I just don't know. I mean, there's only a certain amount of time, you know. Yeah. Your blog's great. If anyone's not a reader of it, yeah, check it out. It's amazing. Great Thank stories you. in there. Greg, thanks so much for your, um, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.